Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to the um, afternoon session, Bonnie Lake Watershed Protection and Land Use Planning. My name's Anne-Marie Pierce, and I'm an Education and Outreach Specialist with Thurston County. I'm just here today to learn and help moderate the sessions. Um, today we'll be hearing from Paul Fent, who's a consultant with Parametrics, and Jason Sullivan um, is a Planning and Building Supervisor with the City of Bonnie Lake. Um, just want to let everybody know that the sessions today are being recorded. That's why I'm really leaning in on the microphone here, because <laughs> they can want to be able to get good uh, volume on the on the recordings. So the session uh, presentations are being recorded, um, but they're not going to record the Q and A afterwards. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over to Paul. Thank you. Well, for those of you that were in the last session, thanks for <laughs> sticking with me. Um, so we're going to talk about the Bonnie Lake uh, land use plan. I, I think one of the important things, uh, to, to, or a few th background things I'd like to point out about this, this was, a basis, uh, this was based on a grant that came from jointly from the Departments of Commerce and Ecology, and it was uh, an outgrowth of building cities in the rain, which led to all the, a lot of the other things that, you might have been, that have been happening, like the stormwater transfer and so on. But they put out a grant and asked for, are there communities that are thinking about doing, uh, we want to see how land use and stormwater can go together. And so Bonnie Lake was sitting there with uh, the interest in updating their stormwater plan, and they were also already doing their land use planning, and so we put together a grant and, and we were successful. And this is uh, the outcome of that grant. So uh, these are some of the main objectives, adopting a land use plan that's compatible and considers watershed goals or watershed objectives. Applying uh, the idea of applying basin-specific stormwater standards, which is a favorite thing of mine. Uh, conducting redevelopment and stormwater retrofit planning. What kind of, uh, th what kind of information, how can we inform those types of plans? And then preparing actual capital projects, one of those kind of the classic parts of what the engineering public works departments want to have out of these stormwater plans. So it's really important to get, one of the things I think was really important and great about this project and with the, with the concepts and in the long term is the overlap of, uh, of, of the city limits and of Bonnie Lake and Fennel Creek. So this is a map, the yellow line is the city limits and then the blue line is the basin, is the Fennel Creek Basin. This is one of the rare times when you have that, you know, very close overlap of things you have control over and things that, and the stream that you might be protecting. And so if, if anything is going to work out, we can say you, the city has control over the development that's going to affect this creek and there's not a lot of other coordination that really needs to occur. So it, made, it makes, makes a nice laboratory. <clears throat> There's a lot of sub-basins in the, in the city and so on, so a lot of our analysis is done based on these sub-basins. And one of the things I always like to point out about this, and if you're in the last one, you know that geology uh, runs everything, and geology really is important here, because uh, this is a geologic map, and everything that's kind of in this uh, taupe color in the middle here is all uh, outwash and glacial materials and so on. And then this is the Puyallup River floodplain and the, and the corridor. And this orange stuff is what matters. And the orange stuff is the Osceola mud flow. So it's an old mud flow from an eruption at, at um, Mount Rainier. And it came down, and this had been a meltwater channel for the glaciers, and it, it came down, the mud flow came down and filled the channel. And it has dramatic impact on the soils and the way the city developed. Geology matters. So one of the things that we wanted to start with is thinking about uh, stream health. So we, we, we're always wanting to say if uh, connect everything that we're doing in the plan and everything that's going on in land use with stream health. So right now, ecology rates Fennel Creek as category one, meets standards. Pierce County does monitoring. They have an index. It's a 70, which is marginal concern. And then the Puyallup Tribe does monitoring, said acceptable water quality. So this is, it's, it's a good stream. It's in really good, really good shape. So we had, uh, had something to work with. This is the thing that really matters here, and these are a series of BIBI scores. I have to update this. I think there's a recent one now. But you'll see that uh, Fennel Creek gets BIBI scores of, of an average of 40, and 40 is good. And, uh, you know, of course, there's official definition. This is in the old scoring system. But the, uh, what matters here is, is that this is a really good score for a fairly urbanized area. And so why would that be? 
just to put it into more context when we're looking at what, how to direct decisions around re retrofitting and development is, is that here's where Bonnie Lake sits in a scale of BIBI scores from 0 to 50 and a total percent impervious or percent urbanization score. So very high scores for moderate, modest uh, um, in, uh, impervious area rates. But that's a, a set of uh, scores from across Puget Sound. So we did a lot of analyses on uh, looking at hydrology in the basins and so on. Can we figure out a metric so we can find what's the best approach or how, what should our target be for retrofitting? And, and wanted to use uh, uh, metrics that are classic uh, hydrologic metrics and so on and comparisons about between BIBI scores and uh, these different metrics. So we were looking at these, uh, the Y scale is always uh, BIBI scores and then the, the uh, scatters and the lines are based on either this is high pulse count, this is pulse duration, high pulse uh, range, and uh, flashiness index. And just real quickly, high pulse count is the number of pulses over, a, uh, over an annual average times two. Pulse duration is how long is that pulse. Pulse range is what's the season over which those pulses occur. And then flashiness is a flashiness index. And so one of the things that you see in all of these things is that here's where we find these are uh, Puget Sound locations. And Bonnie Lake's always sitting out here by itself, except for maybe here on the flashiness scales. You're going, what's going on here? So uh, we're going to jump over into the other part of this analysis, which is the land use, land use part about land use planning and centers. And then you'll see how these start to tie together. So as Paul mentioned, I'm Jason Sullivan, I'm the planning building supervisor for the city of Bonnie Lake. Uh, the city has really had a kind of a two, almost two different thought processes going on since the early, late 1990s. In late, late 1999, the city wanted to really start identifying how to protect Fennel Creek um, and did a whole big environmental analysis, uh, but that was kind of done in its environmental stormwater silo. Then two years later, in early 2001, uh, we did kind of a commercial districts plan um, that was done in its silo to look at how land use planning would be for uh, commercial areas related to how we would build out the commercial areas. In 2001, there was hardly any commercial development in the city, and we wanted to kind of have a generic plan of how we were going to do that. So fast forward to uh, 2015. Um, we've decided that we need to update our sub-area plans for those kind of areas of the city that we wanted to, to um, identify as growth centers for, the, for under the regional growth strategy for PSRC, um, but also where we really wanted to focus our development. So these three centers that are on the map really are um, about 20% of the city, but are, are planned to handle about 65% of the future growth of the city. So really focusing our growth into a small, small area. And as we move through the map, you'll start to notice why we picked these areas. It, because at the same time, we, we started working with Paul to update our stormwater plan and realized we could take all of this and do it as a iterative process versus treating land use as a static process that stormwater has to respond to, or taking land use and trying to respond it to stormwater. So we took the two of them and overlaid them together and decided out where would be the best boundaries for these centers and how would we best build them out and what standards would we want to do in each of these things, in each of these centers to encourage development. So the kind of the three centers that we focused on were uh, the Lake Taps uh, Center, um, which is mainly a big recreational center, but there's also some high density residential in the area. Um, the other one is our downtown civic campus. Um, where we have all of our big civic uses, but we also want to add more residential, kind of more of that downtown type feel. And then I call this the economic engine of the city. Um, it's our, what we call the Midtown Center, and it is where we have all of our large retail centers. Um, the city of Vine Lake's main revenue source is retail sales tax. And so we needed to preserve that area, but we also wanted to make it a mixed use center to add residential. And each of these centers have a different stormwater strategy that Paul will get into, and that's based on where they're at in the geography. So Lake Taps was chosen because in that area we have Lake Taps, and the plan is to discharge the stormwater to Lake Taps so we don't have to worry about flow control, um, but just water quality if ecology approves that approach. Um, <laughs> we're still waiting. 
Uh, in downtown, we actually built a large regional system um, in the mid-2000s. That is how we're handling stormwater for downtown. And then in, in this area, as Paul says, soil is king. This area has all the best soils to do low impact developments and infiltrations throughout the city and is isolated from Fennel Creek. There's no direct surface water connection um, between the two. So when we came up with the center's plan, I should step back from this, I apologize, I got a little too much onto the science side. Uh, when, we, when we developed the center's plan, we really wanted to do this both on a land use side and a stormwater side. And so we also worked with the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department to figure out how we can incorporate health equity into these centers planning. And we came up with this kind of guiding principles document that would guide both the development of the center's plan and the stormwater plan. And as you can see, some of it's, you know, come on that planning side, because I am a land use planner, walkable, active centers, housing, healthy communities. Uh, cultural amenities, parks and open space, but we also wanted to work on kind of green design and coordinating investments. So when we did stormwater improvements or we did stormwater investments, we were able to capture those in a way that would benefit this, uh, benefit development. So one ideal was one way we sold the center's plan or I sold the center's plan is the great thing about getting it identified as a basin plan from my understanding, and I worked on two basin plans, so if I'm wrong, I got two experts here. But when I worked on basin plans in the past, once you had a basin plan certified, if ecology changed their standards, you got to keep what you were doing under your basin plan, which makes it very predictable for developers. So that's also an economic incentive that you can sell to developers. That if you develop in this area, we have this basin cert plan certified, your stormwater rules are not changing. So we were using our investments in stormwater to facilitate our economic development goals in these centers. So as you can see, we actually got lucked out. Um, Paul and I decided that we were really lucky and not good uh, because there was a lot of things going in our favor that just happened to be really lucky. So we were able to move into a preserve uh, standpoint. Our total impervious surface in the Fiddle Creek Basin was only at 16% as it sat now. So that gave us the advantage of not having to go do a lot of retrofits, but look at ways when we do that center planning that we maintain tree canopy and that we maintain our impervious surfaces. So what we've done is we've also set a lot of impervious surface limits to keep that impervious surface limit low to maintain that kind of 16% overall, which has not made some people in the city happy. So this is what I was talking about, the land suitable for, for development. As you can see, everything here in the light green is the soils best suited for low impact development. So as you can see, that entire center that we said that we're going to put the majority of our growth for both residential and commercial is right on top of all the soils that are the best for low impact developments. And then also, um, they're all kind of, most of these are all closed basins, so they don't have a surface connection to Fennel Creek. So we have a less of a chance of surface water runoff from parking lots or other things entering the stream and affecting our overall BIE score. As downtown it has its own kind of regional detention facility, and then this, most of this center is actually in the Lake Taps Basin, um, and then the other part of it does drain through a tributary to Fennel Creek, but most of that back part of that area is where we have the big large parks that are owned by the city, so less of a chance that there would be an impact on the creek. So we really, um, we really determined this, and when we actually started the project, there was a fourth center, and it was out here what we called the Midtown or East Town Center, um, and we actually dropped it from the project because when we get, started getting into the, uh, the suitability analysis, we really realized that a lot of this area had a really high groundwater table, had the best, the direct, most direct connections to Fennel Creek and wetlands. So from a land use side, we said, okay, that's probably not where we want to put a lot of high density development. And now we're kind of rethinking our strategy for that area and pushing it toward more light industrial because it has a little bit less of an impact when you're talking high residential development because you have to have a lot of impervious surface. So with some limits, we can lower kind of the development thresholds out there to protect that and not be one of our focus growth centers. Um, and yeah, so this is when we looked at the existing stormwater, almost all of downtown is captured in that regional stormwater facility. So we knew from there we already had stormwater maintained and also the impervious surface in this area is almost at 100%. So anything we did was be retrofitting and redevelopment, which was a great way of tying in the standards and the MPDS requirements uh, through development, but also being able to have a basin plan and the advantage for developers not having to do stormwater retention in that area because we already built the regional detention facility and we don't charge people to connect to it. So it's, it's, it's a great, it was something we did to encourage economic development in the area. So
So one of the things that uh, Jason was talking about, and I, again, I said it's one of my favorite things, is basin-specific standards and so on. So we, you saw the coverage maps that were there. So what we looked at is say, uh, what kind of stormwater controls should we do by the basins? So everything that's already closed systems or um, already under treatment would be basins that we wouldn't need to do anything else and that we, they are already set up to accommodate the development that's going to occur. The, uh, the center that's located down in this area here, we have all really good soils and so on. Um, those, uh, based on the analyses that we did, we could be, we're suitable to not have to retrofit back to forested conditions and they'll still meet the standards with the good soils and so on. So we're, there's not, not really necessarily a need to do any of the retrofitting. And one of the things that we, uh, and, and so all this, all the basin planning that we're talking about is, um, is into ecology for approval as an approved basin plan in the, you know, the last, last chapters in the manual. And there's still, it's still under review. But uh, Jason and I worked on Des Moines Creek and, and that was a success, so we're, we're, we're feeling good. So, one of the, so what we did is, is that we did establish standards for those different basins. And you'll see for just Fennel Creek that's not within those basins, this is existing assumption for development, existing assumption for redevelopment. So we went through all the different types of those basins that you saw on the previous slides and said, here are the standards that will apply in each one of those basins. And then you notice that the up, what we call the upper lake basins, because they drain, into, uh, they drain into existing lakes that do have outlets, but we did an analysis on what the effect of full development or any other changes in development or what the effect would be if there was a retrofit that occurred and there were zero or virtually zero benefits to doing retrofitting in those upper basins that drain to the lakes. So we're recommending that it be, if there is retrofitting or redevelopment that occurs for flow control, that they use existing conditions rather than forested. Same thing with closed basins discharging into the ground and then any of the other basins that are closed basins discharging to small wetlands, lakes, and ponds. There's a, you know, we only have 20 minutes, but we did a lot of analyses on the potential effects for, of discharges to those wetlands and to those, uh, to those other lakes. So retrofit planning, we, we started with retrofit planning by saying the usual, well, where's the most of the development? So maybe we can target that. And so did the usual spread and so on. And we found out that most of them, based on these codes here, this is uh, Deborah Jane and uh, Lower Bonnie. So those are, or Lake Bonnie. So those are um, all places where we said, well, that sounds like a good place to start thinking about develop, uh, retrofitting. And of course, uh, the, the, these are the upper lakes. This area here in this shade of green is where the, um, are the lower Bonnie and the, the, lake, the two lake systems that actually do have outfalls that drain into Fennel Creek. Most of the rest of the basins, are, again, are either closed, already have a regional facility, or they have uh, really good soils. And then there's a little bit of area up here in Lake Taps that could use some, you know, use some water quality retrofitting. We have some individual projects there. But we really decided to focus on the retrofit need in these uh, basins here. And one of the things that we did was find wh where the opportunity was. And so um, th those are those two basins blown up on the aerial photos, and there are literally zero vacant lots in those two basins. There were one in the old area photo had one last subdivision that had like 10 lots in it that was being built when you're looking at the thing. There are no vacant lots and there's no vacant land in here. So the next thing that we looked at is, is that road right away. So we did a screen for road right away and said if you're more than 60 feet of uh, right away and then less than uh, 20 feet of pavement and uh, less than, a, I think it was a 5% slope, and we said those are suitable. And so this is what ended up with um, uh, where we ended up is everything in the yellow and with some of the red inside of it are road sec segments that are suitable to do retrofitting in. So we do a bioretention or whatever good methods would fit. But anyway, that's, that's basically the, the land that we have available to us for retrofitting. And it amounts to about being able to retrofit about 40% of the basin. So one of the things I often say about looking at this thing is, is it can have a lot of uh, ideals about what we want to do, but a lot of this is just based on potential and opportunity. And so if, um, and, and uh, acquiring houses for stormwater is a very unpopular politically. So this is kind of it here. But I, I, wanna, I wanna kind of go back to, um, well, we'll kind of continue here on the, on the outcomes. Bonnie Lake really is different. And of course I say that everybody's a little bit different some, but one of the things I want to circle back to that whole idea about um, those really high BIBI scores and so on and why they could be. And I think that there's, um, 
there's really about three reasons that are there, and you know, it's it's helpful to be lucky as well as good. So one thing is is that all the foresight that the city had to build those regional facilities mattered. Um, the second is is that those closed systems, uh, all those all that development doesn't become part directly part of Fennel Creek. So those are uh, impacts that aren't realized in the creek. And in fact, because of all those closed systems, they actually support a really strong um, base flow in Fennel Creek. So all that, all that stormwater that's going in there is, is becoming good base flow. Uh, so that is one of the things that's really supporting health of Fennel Creek. The next thing is, I go back to geology, is, is that mud, uh, the mud flow. So one of the things that mud flow did is, is that it's all wetlands that are created on a mud flow. So there's this huge riparian zone around Fennel Creek. And if you've seen any other things or looking at other research, it's starting to come out, you know, that these riparian, intact riparian zones are really important for, uh, uh, for stream health, especially for BIBI. And these are, a lot of them are pastured and so on, you know, so they're not forested, but they're still intact and there's no, really little or no development around them. So I think that, that that combination of factors is what really leads to why you know uh, Fennel Creek is still doing really well, even though there's this town built on top of it. So um, I, I you know again I, a, uh, advocating the idea about basin conditions and applying them to land use, we adjusted the boundaries of those town centers to match suitable soil. So they were they got moved around a little bit on the edges. Um, basin specific approaches are, are I think are useful because. You want to be spending, it, we have limited dollars, and we meaning the public or uh, private or, or whoever's doing this, so why spend money you don't need to spend on stormwater? And then uh, the retrofit planning is complex. So the opportunity is really what's important. So that's all, all we have for this one. Any questions? <laughs>